Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. Yeah, man. So um, tell us how you got the record deal, though. So... I did the book. I got the Porter Studio. We started putting stuff together. Heard Planet Rock. Planet Rock's blowing up. I said, "Okay, computer age is ahead." So I put together a, 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 a tape, a cassette, uh, tape the shop, and you know, I'm, I'm I'm throwing all the 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 positive messenger stuff on there, and. While we, you know, because I used to play our stuff when we did gigs. And, and one of the DJs in, in, in Jam On was a guy named Salvador Smooth. If you look on the on the Jam On Revenge cover, the one guy, the, the, the tall, thin guy with the glasses, with the shades on the Jam On Revenge cover, and you, you see him on the back, the other guy on the keyboard besides me, that's Salvador Smooth. Okay, well, he, he was a DJ in Jam On. He'd tell me, why don't you make a rap record? Now, mind you, I'd already tried to shop a rap record before, but now rap is all over the place, and we thought most of it was whack, you know, because we're from Brooklyn. There was two styles, there, there was a different style of rapping in Brooklyn. And, you know, the stuff that was on the radio tended to be from the Bronx, Uptown, that kind of style where everybody did routines. You know, they, they get the party and they change up and they, this one take a spot and you know, shit. Bo boasting, yeah. Mostly. Yeah, no, 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 no not, not the content, but the style. You know, it was a group thing where they would have to rehearse because this guy had his part, that guy had his part and so forth and so on. That's how rap was done elsewhere. It was a, it was a performance. In, in Brooklyn, it was a battle. You went for Dola. We had, at one tour, at one, one time, we had 10 MCs in, in, in Jam On. Never did a routine. Everybody went for Dola. They took their turn, and they passed the mic, and they took their turn, and they passed the mic. They didn't have a routine. Blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. This, this is about I'm better than you. No, you're not. I'm better than you. That's what it was about. Every night, every every DJ session was a battle. That's how it was in Brooklyn. And, you know, the stuff on the radio was... was da, 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 da. It, it, it wasn't hard, man. It wasn't street. You know, and we weren't feeling it. So... He asked me, why don't you make a rap record? You know, something something play at the parties. So I, 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 at first I laughed and I said, you know, okay. And I decided to make an anti-rap record. Not anti-rap, but anti-rap record. Where, where, where we're talking shit about all the crews that are out there trying to make records, you know. Laughing at them, sugar, sugar pill gang, and and, and, and jam, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Jive, you know, you know, doing it like Funkadelic would do it. I was gonna say George Funkadelic, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, 
I even did it with munchkins, like like George would do it, you know. And, 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 and you know, instead of having any rhymes on there, you know, I did that. And um, there had been a, a a crew that we used to battle against all the time. Um, I forget the name of the crew, but the guy that owned the the, the owned the equipment was called Barrington, so we just called him Barrington. We would blow them out every, every time we battle them. Left and right, battle them. And, and, and one, they had this one guy, Keith Keith, I think his name was, Keithy Keith, something like that. Young kid, but he could scratch his ass off. Now, mind you, we had been DJing from disco days, so especially me, I never learned how to scratch. I blended. I could, I could do any uh, break beat you you got out there. I could blend that shit that fast, but I blended. To me, it sounded better, you know, because I wanted it to sound seamless. This is how the record goes, you know. So we blew them out one day, and, he, and Keith came over to me, said, yeah, you guys are bad, but you can't do this. Wiki, 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 wiki. And I just laughed and said, man, I ain't got a wiki, wiki, wiki. We blow you away every time. <laughs> and that stuck with me. So here it is. I'm making this anti-rap record. And I said, I'm going to throw that in there. So I threw that in there for a few times. And I call it Jam On's Revenge. So here I'm making this positive messenger tape. All, this, all the stuff from shopping for positive messenger. And there's room at the end of side two. So I said, fuck it. I'm going to throw this on there. So I figured, okay, now I'm going to Tommy Boy. Because Tommy Boy put out Planet Rock. If they like that, they're going to love Computer Age. So I, I, I get ready to head out. But I said, you know what? That cat Joe Webb over at Reflection Records he, he 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 gave me that solid and gave me constructive criticism. I'm gonna give him first crack at it. So I go down to Reflection Records. It's not there anymore. It was a, it was just a little office in a one stop. I went there. The office is closed. No, he, they're not here anymore. But he had a real easy name to remember, Joe Webb. So I went. And I look in the phone book. Sure enough, Joe Webb's in the phone book. Remember phone books. Isn't that funny? <laughs> they had them in the phone booth. You go to the phone. Remember phone booths? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I went to the phone booth, found the phone book, looked up, there's Joe Webb. I called him, sure enough, he answers. He said, come on, come on by, let me hear it. I said, great. I got the address. I go. I'm thinking it's a nice office and all that. It's his crib in the projects in Lower East Side. So I go up there and I play. He's digging everything. He's digging all the music. He's digging it. He's digging it. He's digging it. Finally gets to the last song, Jam On's Revenge. He lost his mind. He said, that's it. That's the hit. That's the hit. That's it. That's so forth. I said, yo, man, that thing was just a joke. <laughs> I just threw it on there to, 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 take, to take a room. He said, no, I'm telling you, that's a hit. So forth and so on. I said, I don't know. He said, I'll make you a half million dollars in a year. I was what, 22? <laughs> you know, um, I said, well, I can't pass that up. So that's who ended up doing a deal with him. He was an independent cat. And you know, there it was, the first record to come out on Mayhew Records, which was his own independent label, Jam On Revenge, because there was a typo and they forgot the apostrophe S for Jam On's Revenge. And they forgot the hyphen between Jam and On, but what? So it's Jam On Revenge since then. 1983, right? Yeah, we recorded it in 1982. It took them a, a year to put the damn thing out. So how did you feel when you first heard it on the radio? Oh, my God. I cried. First time I heard it, it was on a mix show. It was on Jonathan Farron's mix show. And 
I cried, man. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It, 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 it was amazing. And um, first of all, I forgot this part. Because we didn't do the positive messenger stuff, and we were doing something that was against our previous positive messenger, we changed the name of the group to Nucleus. Because our, 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 the four of us is the nucleus of three families. You know, me and Neek, first cousins, Yvette's family, and Chili B's family. By now, Neek and Chili B were married, and Yvette and I were married. So, and, and Monique and I are first cousins. So we're the nucleus of three families. Yeah. And that's how we got the name Nucleus. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I cried like a baby. And when it came out, Yvette was pregnant with our first child. And I, at the time, I was working um, Coney Island Beach. Um, and I had a seasonal job working for the Parks Department, cleaning Coney Island Beach in the summertime. So the day my son was born, July 9th, 1983, in the hospital for 11 hours. I got home, sat there with Chili B. I, I was too wired. I, I was up. I played uh, Megalomania. Uh, oh, 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 on Atari all night long. Turn the game over. <laughs> you know, that was remember that was a big thing back then where you get to the game and just stop there. <laughs> you can't go for no further. Turn the game over. So yeah, first time I did that. So now I'm going to work. I had to be at work six o'clock in the morning. But it it, 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 it it was it was like four. So I said, well. I have nothing else for me to do. I'm going to work now. So Chili B got in the van and he drove me down to Coney Island. So I get out there and, you know, I, I, I'm zooming. My son is born. I'm drunk. I turned over Megalomania. I go out there and I start cleaning Coney Island Beach by myself because my crew's not there yet. I cleaned Coney Island Beach from, from um, what is it called? Seaview? So anyway, it's one end almost to the parachute jump. And that's when it started catching up with me. And I said, okay. And I climbed up in the life, lifeguard chair and I passed out in the lifeguard chair. I was woken up by my crew, which had caught up to me. And they had a box. And on the box was playing my fucking song on the radio. That was one of the most amazing moments of my life. Wow. I was like, wow, all of this happened the same day. And since my son has turned 18, every year we go out to Coney Island Pier right next to that lifeguard chair and we bring in his birthday, stay out there all night long. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But um, that, that uh, amazing, amazing. Wow. What, what do you remember about uh, recording that first album? Well, recording the first album, we recorded Jam on Revenge. And, and, um, by the way, we recorded it in Quadrasonic Sound. That was the name of the studio then. The quad, well, they're not anywhere now, but they, they eventually became quad. Everybody was famous after famous for, for doing hip hop there after we turned the place out. At that point, they made pornos up there. They did soundtracks for porno for porno movies. Matter of fact, you went in there and they had the posters of all the porno movies up on the wall. This is what they were known for. Because Joe Webb is a cheap motherfucker and he's going to find the cheapest bargain he can. But um, Dave Ogren was our first engineer too. And we, we recorded Jam On's Revenge in there. Um... The next song that we recorded was Jam On It. Yeah, it was before Computer Age. Yeah, it, it, um, the, 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 the record company wanted us to do a rap record next. We weren't rappers. You know, we were DJs. 
But I said, oh, fuck it. You know, they want a rap record, but you know, I wanted to do computer age, but they want to do a rap record. So came up with, with a beat with 45 minutes, got out my rhyme book, used all my rhymes from the 70s. Chili B said he couldn't come up with nothing, so I wrote rhymes for Chili B, so his rhymes are fresh. So that's why the rhyme styles look different because it was later. You know, and um, Jam On It <laughs> was bored, and it blew up. It blew up. So to follow that up, they wanted, they, they, they to finally let us do Computer Age. But unlike Jam On's Revenge, well, Jam On's Revenge, I don't know what Joe Webb did, but I think when Sunny View got Jam On's Revenge, they put it, they put it in, in, in the pools. Jam on it went to the pools. Computer Age they didn't put in the pools. So Computer Age had to ride on its own merit. And it did damn good for its own merit. Um let me see. I'm trying to Well, how how surprised were you at the uh success of Jam on it? I'm shocked. I'm still shocked. I'm still it's still it, it, it's a complete blessing to me. You know, because I, I, I wasn't expecting it. I knew it was a good record. I knew it from the moment I put it together, it was a good record. But, he, he, you know, he, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's an old time. You know, and um, I can only say that and still feel humble because it, it so little of it feels like my doing. I never worked so little on a track in my life. 45 minutes I worked in that sucker. You know, just threw it, threw it together. Rhymes written years earlier. You know, most of them. But, um... It's yeah. lightning in a bottle, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's blessings in a bottle. You know, and it's still, it's still blessing me to this day. How, how, how did it change your life when it hit you and your family, your young family? Well, we didn't make any money because Joe Webb was stealing all of it. So it, it's mm. not like we, we made money. I eventually started making money because, because of um, songwriting. But Joe Webb took all of our royalties. So it, it didn't change our life. We lived in, I, I lived in the same, in my mother's house until, 2008. What about yeah. in terms of fame, though? I mean, you got out there and you started. We didn't get famous. You, you, you ever, you ever seen a Nucleus poster? Didn't you guys do some shows? Yeah, we we did the Fresh Fest. That was great. You know, that was fantastic. I, I, <coughs> I don't want to sound ungrateful. We were blessed, but we did. If we did, we did a tour first with Cameo and O'Brien. And then we did the Fresh Fest. That was it. We didn't go to Europe. We did we, we did we did Soul Train. And we did um one other TV show that I've never seen. Some must have been some local show. That was it. You know, well, how, um, it must it, it must have been it must have been a kick to go on Soul Train though. Oh, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. Um it, it, except they were too cheap to bring the girls. So they sent the girls. We 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 had we had a tour bus that was fantastic. They 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 took us off the tour bus. Me, Chili B, the drummer, and there's no drums on the song, and and, and the dancers, and sent the girls home on the bus. You know, all of this shit wouldn't wouldn't fly if I had known. But I, I was young and I didn't know what was going on. And they they were you know Joe Webb was running shit and he was running shit out here how he wanted to run it you know mm -hmm. so he was too cheap to 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 fly all of us so no they send them back they don't need the girls on there you know but but the girls sing on the song it's a small part but they sing on the song the dancers don't do anything you know but um yeah no um well in hindsight uh, based on what you're telling me. Um, do you think Tommy Boy might have been a better path? Oh, oh I, I, I'm sure it would have been. We would have gotten ripped off, but we wouldn't got ripped off for all of our money. <laughs> you know, um, no, it, it would have been a better bet. But but 
life is what it's supposed to be. You know, it is what it, so I, I, I don't have regrets. You know, right now my life is seriously blessed. Well, tell, tell, tell me about going out on that one tour though with Cameo and uh, I'm assuming oh. you were a Cameo fan or not so much. I was a Cameo fan. Yeah. I didn't know O'Brien. O'Brien was new, but yeah, I was a Cameo fan. I was a DJ. So of course I was a Cameo <laughs> fan, but, but no, that was fun. You know, because you know we we were playing for for you know a a a a a a I wouldn't say a mature crowd, but they weren't excuse me excuse me kids, and we had to learn our chops on that tour. They just threw us out there, you know, and um, I had gotten Sal Salvador Smooth in the group to play keyboards with me. But but Sal wasn't showing up for practices and stuff like that. So I said, so I ended up, you know, letting him go and teaching the girls the keyboard parts. So the girls play keyboards, you know, but we only had like two rehearsals before we hit the road. And we didn't have any roadie or anything like that. So we got out there and all my Cables were spaghetti and all this. So the, our, our first show was a disaster. A disaster. But after the show, I sat down and I untangled all the cables, got everything straightened out and all that. And so by the next show, we were kicking it. And it was while we were on that tour to jam on it. Hit. And so we, you know, with the opening act, we go from, okay, who's this? Oh, wiki, 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 okay, and so forth and so on, to boom, boom, boom. Ah! <laughs> and, 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 and that really impressed Cameo and O'Brien. They said, oh, shit, these, these young people ain't playing games. You know, but um, no, that was that was fun. But the Fresh Fest was amazing. Now, who else? What was the total lineup on Fresh Fest? Um, it was us. Then Fat Boys, then Houdini, then Curtis Blow, then Run DMC. So that, that was one hell of a show, man. And in between, and in between each act, we had break dances on another stage. So the show was nonstop. So they had break dance acts, and then us, then then us. Well, they weren't all break dancers, but mostly break dancers. But they had poppers, all of that. It was a damn good show, man. I, I went to a similar show like that. It was Run DMC, Houdini, Beastie Boys, LL, um, maybe one or two others at the Long Beach Arena in '86 when they had the big riot. And yeah, uh, okay, I was there, man. It was scary. Yeah, <laughs> Bloods yeah. and the Crips turned it upside down. Yeah, that 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 was a famous one. Yeah, Houdini and them were then there that night too. Yeah, that, that, that was something. Yeah, Run never even got to take the stage. <laughs> yeah, they they did when we did Long Beach, they did a little something the, the first year too, but it wasn't like that. That was crazy. Yep. I love to tell the story. Um so what changed, you know, how did you approach the second record? The second album? Yeah. Oh, well, I, 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 Jonathan Farron, who, 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 you know, I, I, God bless him, he, he did a lot for us, you know, by putting, boosting Jam on Revenge and, you know, remixing it and all that. But Jonathan Farron thought that he owned the group. So he, he took no more running and make it, it took all the instruments out basically and made it a dub. He took Auto Man, took half of the vocals out. Same thing with 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 with, with no more running. Took the vocals out, and made it a dub. He took Destination Earth and took the vocals out, and made it an instrumental. You know, so these people were fucking up my music. That's all I all I saw. Remember, these were positive messenger songs. These songs meant something to me. So for the second album, I say, oh, fuck that. I'm going to give them shit that they can fuck around with. I'm not going to give them any more of my songs that mean something. So, you know, we did a whole bunch of up, up 
up-tempo, you know, dance party songs, you know, songs that didn't have a meaning and all that. And we had one positive messenger song that I didn't put on the first album because it was too melancholy, you know, and it was called Why? And um, Mitty had just come out by the time we were doing the second album. So I had many equipment for the first time. Many changed my life because instead of playing everything live, I can now record everything, you know, MIDI and edit it and all kinds of stuff, you know, and do all kinds of things, step mode, all, all kinds of things, you know, that I couldn't dream of doing before. So I took Y, the original version, the Positive Messenger version, and redid it MIDI. It was the first song I ever did MIDI, and I did it all jazz, funky jazz. And Joe Webb's partner, Frank Fair, he, 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 he was a sensei, and he used to work out to the new version of Y. He wanted it on the album. I told Joe Webb, I'm not putting it on that album, because John DeFerrin just going to fuck it up because it's one of these songs that means something. It's, it's a positive messenger song. It means something to me. He gave me his word that Jonathan Farron wouldn't touch it. So I did the album. You know, we did the new album, all that. Go crazy on it. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I, I, I like the songs and all that, but they're songs meant to be remixed and touched up and all this and all that. You know, it, it, we had fun doing it, but uh, uh, record, uh, we laid down why. Jonathan Farron was in the hospital. He was dying of AIDS. No, we didn't know that yet. He was dying of AIDS. They gave him why, you know, he, he came out the hospital. He was too sick to go in the studio. So they took the equipment and, and, and put it in his in his in his house. He mixed Y when when Joe Webb told me he wasn't going to touch it. Went back in the hospital and died. So if you listen to Y, the strings are out of phase. The poor guy, because it sounded like he tried to leave it alone and not mess with it so much, but the strings are out of phase and it. Fading in and out. No, uh, so uh, again, I hear my music. I, I remember the, the first time I heard Auto Man, I cried. I said, and Adam Levy is like, well, this is, this is great. And I said, man, he fucked the song up. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's rough. And it, 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 the experience that I had from that, taught me the most valuable lesson in the music business there is. Own and control your shit. And I have owned and controlled everything I've done musically ever since. But um, yeah, that was the second album. Second album was fun to do because it was easy to do. It wasn't much to it, you know. And, and it was the most chilly being I ever really worked together. Because he, you know, he was now fo as focused as I was, you know. But um, it didn't do as well as the second album. First of all, Sunny View went under right after they put it out. But I don't think it could have done as good as the first album anyway, because it it it, it, it doesn't have the sincerity of being music from from the soul that the first album did. Mm. So, what did you and your crew do? Uh, after that, you know, when there was no third record? Well, it, as we were doing the second album, I go up to, Joe Webb kept telling us we're in the red. Saying, when are we going to make some money, Joe? We're in the red. The first album, we know it went gold, but they said, oh, it's, it almost goes 480-something thousand copies. Oh, we should get some money. No, you're in the red. Jam on, it's a huge hit. They didn't certify platinum or anything, but we know how, how much jam on it. Everybody's got a copy of jam on it. No, no, you're in the red. So it was by the time we're doing the second album, I had stopped, you know, just dealing with Joe Webb and learned to go up to Sunnyview 
and talk to the people up there. And that's how I met Greg Ford. And that's how I met Adam Levy, you know, and, and Dan Joseph, you know, he used to hang out with these guys. So as we're waiting for the second album to come out, I'm sitting in Adam's room, Adam, Adam's um, office. And I just out of, out of, out of, out of, the side of my mouth, I just say, hey, Adam, when are we going to get out of the red, man? So said, what are you talking about in the red? I said, Joe Webb says we're in the red. Said, we cut him a check for a quarter million dollars just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> so that's when I realized we can. And the thing is, I had money by that time because I was making so not real money, you know, but more money than I had known at that time because I was getting starting to get um ASCAP and um you know songwriters. Chili B didn't write any of the hits, so he him and Neat was struggling, you know, you know, and, and, and unless we got a gig and Joe Webb was taking most of the money for the gigs too. So we went and we got a lawyer. And we started going after Joe Webb. And, and that shut things down. because we, We're not going to work with him as long as all that shit is going on. If, if to, what I know now is I should have just sidestepped him and gone directly to the label. I could have done that. But I didn't know that then. And I didn't have the lawyer telling me the right shit to do because the lawyer, I, I didn't have the right lawyer. So, so um, what the Lord did tell me was, well, you, you can't do nucleus, but you can produce. So Chili B and I started producing. So that was what the rest of my life became, you know, until recently when I started doing the nucleus stuff and I got all my rights back, you know, um, started producing other artists and, um, Eventually found house music and started a whole nother career in that. When was the last time that you were on stage as Nucleus? Was it all uh, the way back then? No, 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 no. We do shows now. Okay. We do shows now. We did a Nucleus show October last year. When did you first come back on stage as Nucleus? 2005. Out of that no, 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 that's not true. No, before then, we 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 were um, touring with a um, with, with with a dance crew. I'd say probably about two thousand, two thousand one. How did that feel when you returned to the stage as new? Oh, it, it, it felt great, you know. Um, it, it it was completely different because we weren't live anymore. So you know. At least for me, it kind of felt easy, you know, because everything's a computer and all that. And then just basically doing vocals and solos and, you know, some tinkling. But but um, no, no, it felt great, man. It's great. To it must be. have felt good to kind of at least, you know, claim what, what was rightfully yours that way. Oh, no, no, that that felt really good, that part. That's why the, m m more than the, the, the shows is getting getting the masters back and, and, and laying claim to the music and taking that back that that that's the most essential part of my life right now besides my family how, how did you feel um as hip-hop and rap changed in the mid late 80s when you know the real hard stuff like public enemy and the and the west coast gangster rap started coming were you into any of that or not yeah no I, I i love all music man you know um i was gonna say i don't love the genocide shit side of shit and i don't the high crime you know the, the the shit that kind of promotes crime or killing and all that shit you know, especially the way now these people seem very serious about it. I don't like it because I think it's killing us. But um, I can't overlook a dope track and I can't overlook dope rhyme skills. I can just 
wish they did better content, better um, rhymes and stuff. And, and then there are some things that, that, that are so ridiculous, you know, so so far out there, and I just love it because they're out there. You, 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 as far as I'm concerned, you can't take them seriously, like anti up. You know, fuck you, Your Honor. Check my posada. You know, that shit is so far out there. I say, oh, these motherfuckers ain't serious. They're ridiculous. You know, get them, get them, boy. That shit. You know, but um, I, I I love dope rhyme skills. I love originality. I love creativity, and I love a dope track. You know, um, a lot of the stuff that's happening now lacks the creativity and the originality. So as far as I'm concerned, it's not hip hop because in hip hop, the first rule is you don't bite somebody's style. And they all biting each other's styles now. So they're doing rap. They're not doing hip hop as far as I'm concerned. You know, but uh, even still, the music, while it's not hard anymore, it's still beautiful. A lot of the music is really good. You know, you certainly had a cautionary tale to share that I really wasn't aware of going into this. Uh, hopefully some uh, listeners and viewers will take something away from that if they themselves are, you know, trying to pursue music. I hope so. Especially in this day and age, if I had the, 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 the opportunities, the, the, the technology, the tools, the, 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 the outlets, that exists now to doing your own music, you know, um, you know, and, and owning and controlling and putting your stuff out there. If I had had that back then, oh my god, oh my god, I, I don't, I don't think people understand what a, a, what what a, an amazing time, as far as music is concerned, that they're living in, and. and, and you know, I know the, the, the opposite side of the coin is so many people are doing music and so much music is coming out, it's hard to get noticed. But as far as I'm concerned, the cream always rises to the top. So maybe, maybe, you know, if, if, if you can't get your stuff heard, if you're not getting the following over your stuff, maybe it's just not that good. And maybe you need to pick it up, you know? But if you believe it's that good, keep plugging at it and it will get there. It will rise to the top. I honestly believe that. Yeah. Especially, I mean, coming from where you came from with the positive messenger, yeah, doing it for the right reasons, coming from the right place, being sincere about it, you know? Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Cosmo, if you mm -hmm. could think for a moment, if you could only have five albums to listen to for the rest of your existence, what five might they be? Asia, Steely Dan, The Emancipation of You Masakila, Funkadelic, Let's Take It to the Stage, not Let's Take It to the Stage, um, um, Standing on the Verge of Getting It On. Uh, Pat Metheny Group, The Way Up, Santana, Welcome. All right, man. That's nice and diverse for sure. Jazz, rock, all the things you were talking about before, you know? Mm -hmm. Funk, yeah. Love it. Um, what, you know, looking back, uh, what are you most proud of accomplishing in your music life? Being the, 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 the creator of it, you know, doing it all myself, you know, w w without people bringing it. And that's not every record, but, you know, I I'm saying for the most part, you know, the actual being able to create a, an accomplished song, full, fully, fully formed, playing it all, writing it all, 
imagining it all coming from my heart and my soul and my mind and having it move people. You know, and so many people tell me how their stuff has moved them. That, that, that never gets old. It, there's no greater feeling. Well, there's a lot of great feelings, but there's few greater feelings than being on stage and hearing people singing your lyrics, man. You know, it's like, wow. You know, that's an incredible thing to me. I, 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 that that's what made me makes me most proud musically. Is there uh, something that's on your bucket list musically? Oh, I'm sure there are lots of things on my bucket list musically. One is to get this damn album out. I've got a new nucleus album out, and I keep finding reasons for it not to be finished right now. Because I've been inspired. I, 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 Method Man inspired me. I heard Method Man's latest shit. And I said, damn it, Boom Bap is back and I'm going to do it. So I'm writing three Boom Bap cuts for, for the album, which is holding it up. So my bucket list is to get this last Nucleus, well, maybe last, but next Nucleus album out. And um, next year is 40 years since, um, since, since Jam on Revenge came out. So... Maybe it's appropriate. I, I'm more than content. I am happy. You know, I have I have the love of my life that I live with. I, you know, I'm not rich, but I but 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 I'm not hungry. You know, um, maybe maybe that's part of the problem. Why I can't get this album done? Maybe I need to be hungry, but I'm not. You know, I'm blessed. So, but um. Well, I got to say, I was impressed with uh, your website. You know, I really hadn't checked it out much until we set this up. And I mean, you got a lot of music on there. Uh, people should definitely go check that out. A lot of music yeah. that they may not be aware of. Um, some cool cuts, you know, some jazzy electro funk kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah. It's going to be more, too. We're getting ready to do a big push and get more stuff out, you know, on, on, the, on the website. Why don't you tell everybody what that website is? www.jamonproductions.com. And when you go there, make sure you check out The Vault. It's free music. And it's, I mean, downloadable free. And it's stuff that, that, that pertains to our history, including a lot of the demos and the original four-track Porter Studio stuff that we that was positive messenger, all kinds of stuff on there, and more going to get added as well. What's the best concert you ever attended? Best concert I ever attended. I I, I would say the first funkadelic show I ever went to, which was um, in Nassau Coliseum, because I was tripping with me. Monique and Pete, and we dropped some acid on the way to the to on the way out there because you had to take the train to the bus and the, and everybody I think out there was tripping with us <laughs> and it, 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 it was it was Parliament Funkadelic, um, BT Express, Crown Heights Affair. Who else? I forget who else, but it was one hell of a show. Is that pre? Uh, is that pre mothership or? Yeah, that's pre mothership. Yeah, pre mothership. And he <laughs> tore the place out. They, they, they did, they did mothership, but they didn't have the mothership yet because that was when that album just dropped. Yeah, wow, that sounds like awesome experience. I didn't see him until '78, I think. So. Uh, they were great in the 70s before he got on crack <laughs> but I think their shows are still good but he killed his fucking voice man I feel so bad for him yeah you talk about a raspy but you were mentioning yeah. that horse yeah. he's the king of horse <laughs> mm -hmm, yep. Yep. <laughs> but God bless him still at it you know I still at it God bless him yeah bless him. Yeah. so uh, man it's uh, exciting news about an album maybe coming soon 
Um, yeah. What, ki- what kind of sounds should people sort of expect? Is it going to be the same or is it going to be a little different? No, it's not the same. I don't do things the same, man. I'm, I roll with the time, with, the, with, with my time. Because it ain't going to sound, Nucleus didn't sound like nobody else. This ain't going to sound like nobody else. It's going to sound like Nucleus now. There's no other way to explain it. New Nucleus. Yes, it's going to be new Nucleus. It's going to be, you're going to know it's Nucleus, but you're going to say, damn, that's that's, that's on some other shit. (laughs) And it's still funky, still long. Still electronic, still, 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 still beats, still hip hop oriented, um, still solos, still vocals, very vocally, but um, it, 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 it's don't sound like nothing else out there. Wow, look forward to that. And uh, any other thing else you want to say out to the fan base or? Just be good to each other, y'all. This world is nuts. And we got to take care of ourselves. We got to take care of each other. Look look out for each other. Be good to each other. Do, do to other people what you want done to you. Unless you're a masochist. <laughs> Follow that golden rule. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much, Cosmo. It's really been fun. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. It was fun, man. I hope I didn't ramble on too much. No, you told some good stories, and I appreciate the detail. No, my pleasure, man. Take good care of yourself. All right, you too. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net, and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on on vibing to the rhythm of the one.